Today we're taking a look at the MSI Ventus 3080OC graphics card. The Ventus 3080OC is the lower level card in MSI's 3080 lineup, and despite the lower price compared to the Game EX Trio, it's not really fair to call something at this price point an entry level card. So let's see how the card performs and how well it runs in a few mini ITX cases. Hey there, and welcome back to Machines and More. If you've been following along on the channel, you'll have seen the first impressions on this uh, Ventus 3080 card, as well as a couple of thermal mods involving deshrouding and installing an AIO. So today I'm doing a detailed look at this card, and I'm also gonna show you some of the thermal performance that you can expect um, out of its stock behavior that you can get with this card. I'll be looking at its performance in the Cooler Master NR200 and also the Lianli TU150. Now, I will note upfront, very importantly, that I did have an issue with this card, which I have reached out to MSI about, and since I haven't heard back from them, I am publishing my findings as is. And if there are any updates, I will follow up accordingly. What I noticed is that in the stock configuration before any mods or optimizations, the card exhibited uh, symptoms of the heavy heatsink pulling away from the PCB. Now, whether or not this was SAG related, I don't know. Uh, MSI does include a support bracket for use with this card, which isn't applicable in a mini ITX or SFF case with only three PCIe slots available. And as I understand from the information and literature provided by MSI, the support bracket is optional and for reinforcement only. So even without such a bracket installed, I don't think a properly attached heatsink uh, should exhibit this issue. A few times while initially testing this card in stock configs, I noticed that the temperatures would shoot up about 10 degrees past what I had just been testing it at, and it was just out of the blue. Now, what I did in these scenarios was just to check the card for anything pushing down on it or for the power supply cables um, kind of tugging on the card in an unbalanced fashion on the PCB. I checked all the screws too uh, on the back uh, if they were tight, which they were. When all these initial checks were a pass and the temperature was still running high, I did something kind of crazy. I just turned the case on its side and relieved the weight on the PCB and allowed it to rest for a period of about 10 minutes. And when the case was turned back upright, what do you know? The problem went away. Um, this didn't really happen repeatedly, but I did want to note it because I don't think this is a thermal paste issue. When I tore down the card, I noted ample thermal paste present. And after that, for the remainder of the card uh, testing, I didn't observe this to have happened again. But I did want to issue a warning for you up front because there is a potential for that issue. So if you do have this card or you're thinking about getting this card, when you have it in your system, make sure you check the thermal performance. And if something seems out of line, then uh, let MSI know or try to troubleshoot it yourself. And since there are so few of these cards out there, it's hard to get really good feedback yet, but some of you might recall a similar situation with ASUS's Strix 5700 XT where the mounting pressure was insufficient to ensure proper contact. So I don't know if this is similar to that, but the thermal data presented here is representative of the cart in its factory intended state. Now, broadly speaking, this review will be broken up into the following sections. First off is an overview of the card and the cooler design, followed by an overview of thermal performance in two mini ITX cases. I'll discuss noise performance and I'll wrap up with a glimpse of how well this card overclocks and actually undervolts too. So this card uh, follows the reference specs for NVIDIA's Ampere 3080 lineup. It has a GA102 die with 10 gigs of GDDR6X VRAM. The card is overclocked relative to NVIDIA's specs with the stock boost specified at 1740 MHz, but in practice, the GPU did boost higher to about 1900 MHz when it wasn't thermally limited. The cooler follows a similar design to the other AIB 3080 cards on the market, going with an enormous heatsink in order to attain the 325 plus watts that are going into this card at full load. The card is covered by a plastic shroud with uh, three 85 millimeter fans which are similar to the fans found on some of MSI's other Ventus designs. Uh, it features a simple plastic back plate, uh, which has thermal pads attached to it, uh, to the underside of the PCB, to help shed some excess heat. Um, underneath the heatsink is the GA102 die, surrounded by 10 GDDR6X memory modules made by Micron. 
The VRMs are on both sides of the PCB and contact the heatsink through one single layer of thermal pads. It's powered by two 8-pin connectors towards the end of the PCB. The car's appearance is quite simple, featuring a predominantly black color scheme with white labeling, and there's no LED lighting features on the card. On the I.O. side of things, we have three display ports and a single HDMI connector, which is fairly commonplace for video cards in 2020. This card is thick, with the highest points at about 57 millimeters. It measures 305 millimeters long, and unfortunately, this type of larger dimension is quite common for the AIBs. The fans connect to the PCB fan headers via two headers. One header controls two fans, and the other controls a single fan. The heatsink has a total of six heat pipes, a couple of which loop into the center heatsink section twice. Now, build and finish quality for this card is typical for the Ventus line, and I wouldn't call it first rate. Uh, the card doesn't come with any accessories except for a support bracket for the PCB, which from MSI's literature is something the user can install and not required. The card already features a big supporting rib that runs about two thirds of the way across the length of the card, which serves to add some rigidity and resistance to flex and sag. Uh, even without the supporting bracket, I did measure sag in the NR200 to be about three to four millimeters, which would typically be okay and have little to no effect on thermal performance. I do think that the intermittent thermal issue was from the mounting of the heavy heat sink to the PCB and not necessarily caused by twist uh, from this card sagging. If three to four millimeters of sag could cause thermals to fluctuate so wildly, an MSI needs to go back and re-examine the design specs or require users and say outright that the support bracket is required. Um, on the back, you'll see there's a single MLCC, uh, which is common for some of the designs. So the higher end cards may have two MLCCs on the back. The card is very heavy at 1364 grams in weight. As a reference point, this Gigabyte NVIDIA 2070, which was typical of the 20 series cards in general, weighs in at 855 grams. Now moving on to thermal performance of this card. I measured thermals from running the unit in Heaven 4.0 for at least 10 minutes of time and measured the average of the final 30 seconds of the continuous run when the thermal stabilized and didn't change for a few minutes. Without the assistance of bottom fans, the card runs slightly hotter relative to the Founders Edition card as a baseline. A thermal performance in Lian Li's TU-150 was quite poor relative to the NR200. However, this really has to do more with the airflow design of the case than the GPU itself. However, I am presenting this data here as a consideration if you have a case with a similar front to back type of airflow, which really isn't as ideal for GPUs that are exhausting heat out the sides. Uh, something to keep in mind is that before dropping down the big bucks on a card like this, make sure your airflow design is ready to handle a high heat card like this. Otherwise, you might consider picking up a few case fans to get things to run optimally once you have this card. Otherwise, you may be disappointed. While it's not on the order of two 2080s worth of thermal output, you could compare a single 3080 to having about two 2070 cards worth of thermal output in your system, which is still a huge jump up if you're running something like a 2070 level card in your system right now. So it, do take a little appreciation for how much heat is coming out of this card. Uh, the addition of bottom fans does help the card run cooler in the NR200, which can accommodate a pair of slim fans underneath it. Now, even at these temperatures, I noted the card was still boosting to roughly 1900 megahertz, so the performance was adequate even in the smaller cases. As for noise performance, the fans are capable of getting quite loud, similar to other Ventus cards that I've tested in the past. For noise testing, I locked down CPU cooler and system fans, uh, down to a low level to isolate the sound from the GPU with the idle noise floor at about 42 and a half decibels from 20 centimeters away. Here's a quick acoustic comparison of the different fan speeds and the associated decibel values from about 20 centimeters away in the open NR200 and closed TU-150 behind a tempered glass panel. And the sounds recorded with a microphone at 50 centimeters away from the GPU.
And now here's a quick graph of fan speeds, noise and temperature and clock behavior on this card. Now I wouldn't use this uh, to get an absolute idea of the noise level at which the GPU is running, but just use this as a guideline for relative sound levels. At an average room temperature of around 25 degrees and in a situation where the card can't get the assistance of bottom fans under it, the card is going to want to run in that 70 to 80 percent fan range while at full load and it settles in around 77 degrees. At about 80 percent fans they're spinning at 2300 rpm or so and I found that to be well past my tolerance for having these run constantly. So if you can add bottom fans to it it is a huge benefit to the noise level since that does bring the default fan behavior down to about 60 percent which is a drop of about six decibels on the GPU alone. When you can add bottom fans, the card can run fairly effectively at a quieter noise level. The card is naturally boosted out of the box and at optimal thermal levels runs anywhere from about 1900 to 1950 megahertz, uh, which doesn't quite hit 2000 megahertz uh, in the optimal scenarios, but the out of the box performance should be sufficient for most gamers at 4K. Now, empirically speaking, the 3080 Founders Edition tends to boost to about 25 megahertz lower under similar thermal levels. So MSI's BIOS may be ever so slightly more aggressive than the FE card. I didn't want to make this video too long and belabor you with gaming FPS or performance benchmarks that you can get in other sources, but um, those are more general 3080 topics anyway. And it's not like this card clocks in significantly differently. Uh, compared to any other 3080 cards at the same clocks. And also I didn't experience any irregular behavior while gaming. Most modern titles with DLSS and ray tracing enabled run at 4K well above that 60 FPS and sometimes into the 100 FPS range. I didn't want to touch on undervolting and overclocking this particular card however. The following results are tests done with an open case and without bottom fans. With my particular sample, the card could be pushed manually in the MSI afterburner about plus 200 on the core clocks and about plus 200 on the VRAM to yield a slight performance uplift. The baseline was about 14,250 on the superposition benchmark, resulting in a peak temp of 70 degrees while running at 1850 MHz. And when overclocked this way, the average clock frequency settled in at about 1950 MHz, hitting close to 15,000 on superposition. That being said, I wouldn't get this card exclusively to overclock since MSI's BIOS does power limit this card to about 320 watts, uh, which is really standard. And there's no official way to push past that currently. With the D-Shroud mod and even water blocking the card, there is potential to go higher, but the power limits just eliminate that possibility. Initially in my optimizing the 3080 videos, which featured the D-Shroud, uh, in the part one, I didn't push the undervolting too much, instead opting to focus more on deshrouding. After I sat down and gave more attention to undervolting, the total power use as reported by this system dropped about 50 watts, and thermal improvement in Heaven 4.0 was about four to five degrees, which is actually quite good for a little bit of voltage drop. Uh, for Unigen superposition, the GPU clocks only up to 1850 megahertz or so, and the performance is fairly similar at this undervolt. However, thermals are also greatly improved. It's no guarantee just like overclocking, but chances are if you spend the time to slowly play with the voltage and test what's stable for your card, you could see a huge thermal improvement. Of course, this also means that you may limit yourself to the higher clocks uh, past 1900 megahertz, but for many of us, that level of performance at this point in time is totally sufficient. Now to sum it all up, my impression is that this is a very average card, uh, even when the thermals are normal. The design isn't really innovative, nor are the thermals mind-blowing. Of course, performance is what's expected of a 3080, it's just kind of meh. I also think it's priced a little too aggressively at $740 or so since you can pick up ASUS's Tough 3080 card, which is the natural competitor to this card for the reference price of $700. So if you do have that option, at least in the AIB space, I probably wouldn't recommend this card over the Tough, especially um, when MSI's own Gaming X Trio is so close as well and considering the potential thermal issue. However, I do realize that at least for a while, 
there are gonna be few options in the 3080 space. So if you do see this one available and you wanna grab it, just know that it's not necessarily a bad option, but make sure you check out your card to make sure there's no thermal issue present. And if there are, take action. So I hope you've enjoyed this review of the MSI Ventus 3080OC. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already and leave a comment down below if you have this card or you have any questions. Let me know how it's performing for you. I also have a few more reviews in this series related to the 3080 cards and SFF, so please stay tuned for that and some optimization videos. I appreciate your watching this today and look forward to seeing you again on this channel.